And that's, I think, a unique thing that I can do uh, in telling these stories. Today, I'm speaking with Brooke Cunningham, CMO of InRiver, a leading provider of product information management software. One of your jobs is to elevate not just your company, but the category. Talk about its importance, educate people, be a thought leader in the category. How do you, you think about doing that just recently as CMO at InRiver, this is an area that I, I started assessing what we had and where I needed to tackle uh, filling in the gaps, if you will. I've discovered a lot of elements of even a more integrated marketing approach that weren't there. We really didn't have a focus as a, as a, as a company on elevating from a PR and, and media perspective. So that's been a focus area since I've come on board and starting to tell the story. And the challenge that I see ahead of me is Welcome to Top CMO. I'm chatting with Brooke Cunningham, CMO at InRiver. And Brooke, one of the, I think, things that's interesting about the product information management category is that it's important to anyone who's doing large scale e-commerce. It sometimes gets forgotten about. So one of your jobs is to elevate not just your company, but the category. Talk about its importance, educate people, um, be a thought leader in the category. Um, how do you, you think about doing that in maybe a category that isn't the, the sexiest software category ever, but as you and I know, it's an important category. Thanks, Ben. I'm so delighted to be here. So yes, it is uh, an exciting challenge. So I joined InRiver in January of this year. So I've been in seat as the chief marketing officer for just over three months and have had a really fast start. And I've spent my entire career in data related B2B software. And so I'm very familiar with uh, a lot of the products uh, in the data related uh, category of software. And uh, I was very interested when I learned about InRiver because it was something so powerful, but I, in fact, had never heard of it before. And being that I've been in the space for almost 25 years, it was pretty surprising. So I knew that that was a challenge that I would have as CMO, but I was up for that challenge. And so I, um, as I dug in and got to learn the product really quickly, and uh, I saw a very exciting opportunity in working with the CEO who he and I had worked together previously at SAP. I knew we had great leadership, a uh, great product, and learned very quickly that this product information management category, while relatively unknown, is extremely powerful and can be really sexy and it has a really high purpose uh, quotient for me because it can really help power sustainability for brands around the globe. So yes, my my initial uh, challenge and focus uh, coming in as CMO is to both elevate the brand of InRiver, but also the category overall and start educating the market. And uh, I started with trying to understand who our ideal customer profile is and starting to really understand the personas in in those uh, those particular customers and and product information management for those that aren't familiar with it is really helps power your entire product journey if you are specifically a manufacturer industrial manufacturer or brand manufacturers so in river has just absolutely amazing customer logos including Cartier and New Balance and Estee Lauder and Ethan Allen and Living Spaces just to rattle off a few of those household name uh, branded retail uh, uh, retail brands and also a lot of maybe less familiar but very large uh, industrial manufacturing brands as well and so you know the challenge that I see ahead of me is helping create more awareness for this category, in particular, understanding uh, within the market around how product information can help manufacturers uh, address the upcoming challenges around sustainability, while also managing very, very complex product information journeys. Okay, well, well, and so just to kind of get into the specifics of, of, of how you're elevating the category, and of course, the company, well, let's talk about sustainability. Um, because I can see why you would you would pick up pick on that because one, it's a it's it's a it's a hot button topic and issue. We know you know especially in in kind of millennial generations and and and, and younger, it becomes sort of elevated importance. Um, but but also to olders too. And so it's a hot button topic. Um, companies are are uh, you know 
increasingly getting more sophisticated. We have a lot of clients who come to top that are like, help us with our sustainability report. We don't want to be seen as green, greenwashing would be the term that we're just sort of paying lip service to this as well. So is that why you've kind of focused in on that? Because you're managing complex product information, sustainability related information could be part of that information mix that's hard to, to, to manage. And that becomes your best way to maybe educate and elevate because like if you're not in the sexiest topic that people know about let's connect to a sexy one and sustainability is right now and so is that is that the thought on the strategy uh yes i i believe there's a uh, this is top of mind and sustainability used to be a nice to have but it's becoming a have to have with a lot of the regulatory requirements that are coming into play so i i believe there's a really important need to help educate the market about that and uh you know the, the volume of data that we all have to manage is absolutely massive. So as it relates to product information management, we've got executives getting inundated with demands for product information. They've got to address components within their organizations, how to launch more products, shorter lifespans on products, tons of detailed product information. And we're not just talking about SKUs and descriptions. We're also talking about the marketing pieces. So your product imagery, your product videos, how are you showcasing your products? And then how are you activating those products? And so we've got all that complexity, which is predominantly internal, but then we've got the external drivers. So we've got all the e-commerce and on the channel buying. We've got the demands for personalization in the products and experiences. We all now, I, I believe, expect a B2, B, a B2C experience, even when we're talking about B2B, uh, that online shopping experience, we expect it to be easy. Um, and, and we know that consumers are expecting, uh, more self-service. Uh, so being able to activate that effectively is, so do you then, I know, you know, any kind of B2B company, customer stories, interesting use cases, um, can be hugely important. Are you trying to do that for the sustainability category to, to say, Hey, if we can find more people who are, who are, are, you know, showing how to be better stewards of sustainability through our products. If we can capture those stories, those stories become important in a, in a hot area. Absolutely. I think they're important in a top area. In fact, we, we know from some of our customers that this is critical. Uh, many of our customers actually have commitments to sustainability. And on your point earlier about, uh, you know, brands not wanting to greenwash that they're publishing data, about what they're actually doing in terms of recycling materials um, in in their reports to both the boards of directors or to their uh, to their client base as well, and uh, you know there's there's legislative pressure coming into play. So the digital product passport is coming into play in Europe in the coming years, and component parts like batteries are going to have regulations on being able to track the entire uh, production path of, of batteries um, in any products uh, starting as soon as next year. And, and, you know, we see that, you know, a lot of uh, commitments that different companies are making to reducing carbon em emissions. And uh, I, I think that there's both a, an imperative around it. And yes, it is a top of mind um, theme that can help gain awareness and relevance in today's market. So, so and who do you, do the people you're, you sell to um, understand that? The, the reason I ask is that, sustainability might be managed by someone who isn't managing, you know, all of the product information that's flowing around to different platforms and different e-commerce stores and all of that, right? So they, they may have a sense for it, but it's not their day-to-day -day to think about sustainability. So how do you think about connecting that? Do, do they get it? Do they get that, hey, this is important, we need to be doing this? Or is that like a different department and you have to like bring the other department together and say, hey, you know, uh, you know, kind of, corporate social responsibility team that's doing this, here's how we can help you, you know, have a piece of, of telling that story better. How do you, how do you connect players at these sort of big companies or do they get it right away? Some of the bigger companies do understand it, but I do see a role uh, in what I'm tackling as CMO at in River in helping to educate more of the market around what is going to be required from a regulatory perspective so that we, when we're addressing our, our target audiences, that there is an understanding of that. And, and it is certainly a challenge as you're looking at some of these larger companies or brands 
that yes, there are many players that that play a role in in these uh, these different sales cycle, and that's where uh, telling some of the stories and, and bringing some of our uh, our personas to tell the stories of how they're using this uh, uh, in terms of the sustainability data to really support uh, their initiatives as well as meet those regulatory uh, regulatory uh, um, changes that are coming. So, so do you think about how to be a thought leader around regulatory changes specifically that that's something that um maybe compliance teams follow closely but other teams that are you know managing product information and e-commerce aren't thinking about do you what do you do to establish thought leadership around regulations and i know there's a lot coming out of emea region you've referenced that that because of the supply chain and the global supply chain we live in affect people everywhere so how do you think about that I mean, do you do data reports? Do you do other types of white papers that are on the effect of regulations? Like just ha what take, take us through your kind of thought leadership mindset. Yeah. And coming in uh, just recently as CMO in River, this is an area that I, I started assessing what we had and where I needed to tackle uh, filling in the gaps, if you will. And so I started by taking an approach of number one, uh, starting to build the content that really ad addresses some of the things that you brought up. So how am I telling the stories around what was the traditional product journey versus now what the the more circular product journey needs to look at? And, and so yes, indeed, we're actually uh, partway through uh, a whole series of uh, eBooks and other materials that include uh, some research and data to help tell the story of why uh, why some of these elements of sustainability and the, the more circular product journey are important uh, for manufacturers to be thinking about. And then we're we're cascading that into the different ways and places that we're going to market it uh, with our, our different campaigns and uh, and events and uh, and how we're going to market. Uh, in River is a growing company. So as I came on board, I discovered a lot of uh, elements and even a more integrated marketing approach that that weren't there. So for example, we really didn't have a focus as a, as a company on elevating from a PR and, and uh, media perspective. So that, that's been a focus area since I've come on board and starting to tell the story. Uh, we very quickly uh, made some announcements around launching a new breed of PIM that really talks about how we're powering the entire product journey, really you know, poised to help support uh, our manufacturing companies to, uh, to power that journey of all of their product information. And we are really looking into these amazing customer brands that we have and, and trying to bring more and more of those stories to life, including, for example, coming up soon, we have our user conferences in, in North America and in Europe, and we have uh, different customers coming to tell the stories. And I'm using that as an opportunity to also capture some of the stories and invite our customers to sit down and and tell us more about how they're using the product and for us to collaborate more on how we can also help elevate and tell the stories so that we can uh, really uh, extend awareness of what PIM is, product information management is, and how it can help other customers, as well as I see it as an opportunity to help showcase my peers uh, in other companies. And, and that's, I think, a unique thing that I can do uh, in telling these stories. And there's some higher, yeah, I, I do think there's a, a great purpose element around being able to partner together on sustainability topics uh, and really amplify that message. And then lastly, some of it is around our uh, the analyst community and how we continue to elevate the category of product information management with analysts like Gartner and IDC. And for example, next week, we're going to be with Gartner at their data and analytics event in Orlando. And uh, it's a great first opportunity that New Rivers participated there. Um, and we're working a lot with one of their key analysts to uh, talk more about the, the the power of product information management. Sure. Well, and I think one of the things that's interesting for just the legislative front, I mean, when, when you enter sustainability, is this idea of rapid response thought leadership, which not a lot of companies do really well. And what I mean by that is usually what happens is if, if you're doing thought leadership, you're like, okay, you know, you know, we got four quarters coming up. What's going to be our like pillar, you know, I don't know, piece of content or report or something else for each quarter. So you work real hard on it. You, you release it and you're like, okay, it's out there in the world. Hopefully it gets some like good response. Got some good traction. Yeah. People were excited about it. good. We did a good job. 
and then you're like, okay, let's, what's what's next? Let's move on to the next quarter. And 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 one of the the, the aspects of rapid response thought leadership, what, what it is, is that, well, yes, let's say you made this report, this thing, but like, it can have a whole new life based on changes that happen in the industry, the news, where suddenly it's more relevant, it's more related. So you make this thing, and it's not like you know, you if you build it. If they come, hopefully they come, great, and then tuck it away in a drawer. But rapid response thought leadership is can we give it new life all the time by connecting because regulations are changing, legislation's changing, things are happening that suddenly makes your report from 18 months ago super important for people right now. I completely agree with that. And we are practicing uh, some of that as well. So for example, we've been, and, and we're doing it in a, a number of different ways, but one specific example that uh, we just had from the past week is as we're getting more and more uh, data, we're going back to materials and we are revisiting them and resurrecting them, if you will, uh, to bring them fresh life. And then one of the things that I'm always really promoting with my teams is how do we think about how everything that we're producing then gets um, brought to life in, in all the different ways of places that we're engaging out in the market and that we're then taking that into sound bites that we can use in our social and our digital or how are some of these amazing customer stories coming to life in real life <laughs> with human people telling the stories uh, and not just uh, you know what gets published on the website. Um, so, for example, the a recent blog post we just revisited was we did a whole sustainability blog post. We had done it last year. We we refreshed it with some of the latest data that we have. A recent IBM survey says that 70 percent of employees feel a sustainability program um, is something that is a major attractor for for joining a company. So there's, you know, data points like that uh, where, you know, we're incorporating those into more of our, our recent uh, materials. Another data point is um, seven out of 10 consumers would consider breaking off their relationship with a company if they didn't take sustainability or social issues seriously. Seriously, that was a study that was done by Savanta and Oracle. So just that's, those are examples of, we were putting in some fresh data points that we were taking from other research and uh, gleaning from other sources. And, uh, and we just republished it again last week. So uh, very, very aligned with your comments there. Well, and, and, and do you think, um, you know, third parties that externally validate things are important to what you're trying to do in, in education care. You mentioned doing the, you know, the Gartners and the Foresters and, and, and basically, you know, having a, a, it sounds like a pretty robust analyst relations program. You're participating in conferences and other thing. How, how, how important is that now? Do you think it's important that someone else sort of says like, yes, you're a category. Yes, you're an important category. Yes, here's the, you know, the trend in the category, do you, do you need all of that, do you think, to be, to be successful in your space? So I would, uh, I would answer this related to, you know, for the audience of other CMOs who are in maybe mid-size or smaller companies that are building their brands and don't have the same, uh, you know, broad awareness that some of the bigger brands, I know you have amazing guests that come on the show from some really fantastic and very well-known household brands. And so I would say, yes, that external validation for a smaller or mid-sized company that is building their reputation and, and you're trying to build um, up your credibility with your, uh, with your potential buyers. Yes, I do think that that is a meaningful and important um, part of the, the marketing mix. Uh, and it's something that, you know, as I'm looking at, uh, first of all, elevating the category of PIM, the product information management to really encapsulate uh, a broader set of functionality that it has historically uh, referred to, as well as when in rivers being considered that we are known and seen as the leader that we are in that category. And so that's where I'm using analysts, uh, as well as our customers, um, and then also we've got you know some amazing uh, leadership within our organization that are leading from the front in terms of some of the trends. I'm also leaning into uh, just really elevating those voices so that we can be thought leaders in this space and and really take the lead in the market. And how and do you think um, because what you do relates to supply chain? You know, does the fact that supply chain, you know, typically not a sexy topic, 
pretty sexy in the past couple of years with the pandemic and disruptions and people realizing they can't get certain stuff and they they always assumed it was just there to get and Amazon Prime was going to deliver it, you know, maybe even same day and now you can't get it or something else. Um, have, you know, has that piece of it um, been part of the storytelling at all? Have, have you tried to kind of relate it to to supply chain and, and not just... Um, and I know as you're trying to broaden the category, not so much just like information goes out and lives on e-commerce platforms, but kind of goes multiple directions. It's more of a conversation, all of this and, and sustainability deals with that supply chain as well. Yeah, it, it, in fact, you know, you're spot on. The, the pandemic accelerated, as we all know, it accelerated a shift to more digital ways of doing business, particularly for branded retailers who all of a sudden were, you know, getting people into physical stores. And so this did drive and prompt a lot more acceleration in transformation for how people were thinking about some of their e-commerce strategies. And PIM is really typically a foundation for some of the, that e-commerce. And part of what our solution does is help syndicate that data to other marketplaces. So if you're, uh, for example, a, a vendor that's selling your products, not only on your own web property, but also through Amazon or through other third-party resale channels, uh, some of our functionality can help not only uh, publish and ensure that those things are all the product information is being published accurately and beautifully to all those places, but help you manage the digital shelf, understanding where things sold out, are your competitors running promotions so that um, we've really helped enable our customers have that two-way feedback and doing this manually would be super manual, super time consuming, super expensive, lots of possible errors. So we've found that we have seen a lot of our vendors and our, our customers uh, leaning into this digital shelf analytics capability that we have during the last couple of years. And that's where we have some, some really cool stories uh, that we're starting to showcase around how our customers are using that and uh, and managing things like out of stock uh, or uh, international expansion into multiple countries and languages, that sort of thing. Well, and what do you what did you learn? I mean, you a, a good portion of your career, especially early on, was was spent at SAP. Um, and SAP, we we've had um, you know uh, JG Chirapath, who's the CMO at SAP, on the show. What what did you what do you take with you from an experience like that? Obviously, you know, massive company, massive B two B company. What what is what do you pull through from that experience when that's kind of at your you know one of the foundational companies you've worked at for your whole career? What do you learn from them? Yeah, absolutely. I uh, had so many great things to say about having had that opportunity and experience of working at SAP, and I regard SAP's marketing as absolutely top notch. Uh, I was very fortunate during my my time there to be in a, an extensive global role, and some of the the component parts that I've been able to take forward with me are really understanding how to build for a huge scale, and really address uh, how you go to market in a local way, but scale that um, in a in a way that's effective and uh, impactful and cost cost efficient, and there is a huge focus within SAP on really um, understanding and targeting your your different customer sets by by industry, and a lot of that I'm bringing forward here. I mean, River, we're thinking about how do we think about the different uh, specific needs and challenges that our customers are facing, and really getting into that mindset so that we can help uh, tell the stories of how our customers are solving their problems in a way that resonates for for others uh, who have similar challenges that they're trying to solve. And uh, also at SAP, I had the opportunity to make some amazing connections. And uh, I'm very proud to say that one of those connections led me to my role here at InRiver today, since the CEO of InRiver, Neil Stenfeld, and I worked together at SAP 15 years ago. Well, well, there you go. So, so, so multiple ways it, it worked out. And also in your career, I mean, one of the big themes is you really come from a background of, of, of partner marketing and using partner marketing to unlock ROI, unlock revenue, unlock growth. And that's something that maybe 
unless you really work, you know, have worked at a big company, you don't appreciate how much business partner marketing can drive. So, so how do you approach it now? How do you think about it? And how do you think about like, sort of like unlocking new mark markets, new channels through partners? Yeah. So partner marketing is in fact, how I, I started my career, something I'm super passionate about. And when I have selected my, uh, my next career uh, opportunities, joining a software company that has a focus on an inclusion of partners in their business strategy is something that's, that's really important to me because I've seen how impactful strong partnering relationships can be to expanding your go-to-market by reaching new customers. And in the case of always being in B2B uh, data-related software, reaching new sets of data. And so, so that's going to open up new sales opportunities. And that has evolved. I mean, I've been doing this for over 25 years and uh, the the ecosystem of, of partners has changed a great deal over the years. And it's been really fun to be a part of that journey and, and all of the steps along my career journey. But there's some really important and interesting ways uh, that, you know, for those of you that are maybe looking at how you bring partnering into the mix of your uh, marketing or business strategies, I really suggest thinking about where you have strategic uh, alliance type partnering opportunities. Uh, for us here at InRiver, for example, that actually does include SAP uh, as well as Salesforce since product information management aligns really closely to commerce strategies. So for example, we partner with SAP on their commerce solution. And what we do is we work together with SAP to look at where we have joint customer opportunities. We do joint marketing together. We have the opportunity to join at each other's events, create uh, technology connectors uh, between our solutions to make for seamless uh, experiences for customers that are using both sets of technologies together. Uh, I've also seen a great, a great deal of success in partnering with the cloud partners uh, and in prior companies that's encapsulated all of them uh, here at InRiver. It includes Microsoft Azure and prior companies I've worked at like Splunk. We had a very, very strong relationship with Amazon Web Services and we had a six, very successful approach to building uh, offers on their marketplace as well as uh, what they call private offers, where you create a bun essentially a bundle together that you can take to market and you target particular customers. Um, and th those, in, in my prior experiences, have uh, opened up massive new revenue streams. Uh, they do often uh, require some joint development and, and joint connectors, uh, just like I was speaking about um, as related to the Alliance's partners. And then uh, also, also you know, through the years, I've partnered really successfully with partners that sell software on our behalf, as well as do services. And that's where you can really get expansion into new markets where you don't have as much coverage. And from a marketing perspective, it's a slightly different approach to take across uh, the mix. Uh, but that's something that, uh, you know, with a, with each of the, the sets of partners um, really have a, a focus on how do we go to market together? How do we create the joint messaging? And then how do we create something tangible that we can offer the customer that we can take to market? Well, and, and what is your advice for if, if you're a CMO listening, you'd like to expand, improve your partner marketing, but you're targeting partners that are going to be the Goliaths to your David, meaning you're up and coming. And no matter how but kind of big you get, you start entering certain industries and then you get like really, really big companies, right? You could be like, oh, we're pretty big yeah. until you end up in this other pond and like now we're, okay, now we're not so big anymore. So what is your recommendation for how to develop partner strategies and, and you're the, the smaller fish, you have to attract the attention of the bigger fish. Um, how, how should you do that? It's such a great uh, question and very relevant for, for me here at Ed Rivers. It's we're a growing company uh, and we are partnered with some of these uh, bigger organizations. And so and my recommendation for CMOs or other marketing leaders uh, that are, are trying to do that is, is really hone in on your value proposition and where you can bring value to that other organization as a partner. How are you going to open doors to new, new customers or how are you going to make their existing deployments more sticky or provide an upsell opportunity? So I would really emphasize being very tangible 
uh, in what you're providing. And frequently there's ways and ways we, that those uh, types of relationships can be built where there's either revenue sharing or incentives that can be put in place that make it meaningful for both parties. And, uh, and certainly, uh, you know, being able to articulate where you're bringing that value and getting to the right decision makers. So typically those folks who might sit in a partnering or alliances type of organization, and they will also have uh, then a sort of shared uh, mandate of finding uh, these types of relationships. So those are the folks you're going to want to get to and having a really tangible um, value proposition of something you can bring to market. Well, and then what is your advice for the other side, meaning you're the big fish and there's these little fish kind of circling around. They want to do business with you. And, and sometimes you're like, ah, oh, I'm a big fish. You know, I don't have to bother with you, you little fish, but sometimes you're the big fish and you're blockbuster and the little fish before then is Netflix. And you walk away from a deal with Netflix that probably costs you your entire existence and business and everything just because you didn't realize it was a, it was a little fish, but it had some growth potential. So what is your advice on the other side for partner marketing? Yes, it's in fact, such a relevant question since I've just seen this so many times in my career. I think back to, for example, earlier in my career when I was at Splunk and we were still an emerging vendor and we were coming up in the cybersecurity space and that was becoming such a relevant and a very important topic. And uh, Amazon didn't listen. Amazon Web Services became one of our biggest partners. In fact, we won awards at that time for being uh, eventually one of their biggest marketplace partners. Uh, we were bringing them millions and millions and millions of dollars in, uh, in new, uh, new customer bookings through their marketplace. So uh, I would say listen, uh, listen and pay attention to the trends that maybe are a little bit outside of your lane uh, and be willing to, to lean in. Um, it's really around being open to innovation. Sure. Well, and, and do you, um, you've talked about, and, and I think, you know, in periods of economic uncertainty, um, you know, how to survive, how, how to thrive. How do you think about that? One thing we haven't explored in the show before is how do you think that in terms of partner marketing, you've got to obviously by the definition, work with partners, work with others, but everyone's kind of retrenching a little bit. Some people are like, yeah, I'm not so eager to spend on stuff and I'm cutting this back and I don't know, maybe some of the partners are doing some layoffs some other things. Have you, how do you think about that and sort of partner marketing through that, that lens of when people are a little bit belt tightening, um, how do you get through it? I think that partner marketing actually can be a really creative way to solve for resource constraints. And I've done that successfully in the past when I've been at uh, vendors where we perhaps didn't have huge marketing budgets ourselves. And if you can come together with a joint go to market uh, campaign idea, which you know, could bring alliance partners, selling partners, and then you know yourself as, as one of the vendors all into the mix and combine budget dollars to take that to market or combine you know, shared responsibilities so that you're, you're tapping you know, a smaller portion of the resources within each of your teams. And I've had a number of those types of opportunities where I've taken selling partners that are you know, managed service providers that are selling software and doing services on politicians with a cloud partner like an Amazon or a Microsoft Azure and uh, an alliance partner that may have some uh, strategic um, component that they're bringing into the mix and successfully uh, taken that to market. And you know, thinking of that as like the amplified power of bringing all the brands together, but then also the resources, the dollars and the people. I see. So meaning if you're resource constrained, which is a polite way of saying money constrained, then you might think of OPM, which stands for other people's money that you need to leverage <laughs> exactly. to get out there too. If we're, we're going to be real, 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 a little bit direct about it, that might be a great strategy to maximize that if you can do it. Absolutely. But in fact, you know, it's actually designed, many partner marketing programs are designed exactly that way where you, you have sort of shared investments. So it's really just taking that, that model and amplifying it. Right, which I think will make your CEO super happy if you're like, I know we're tightening budgets, I know we're cutting back in marketing, but I've just unlocked 
10 million dollars worth of marketing value and you're not gonna you're not gonna spend the dime on it exactly you, you can be a hero with the ceo and the board of directors and the, and the cfo too which is always good to have on your side as well so excellent well uh, to, to kind of wrap up uh, you know I, i'd love to hear your thoughts and and, and i know you've spoken in the past about being an authentic leader and that being important in particularly intense times and, and usually intense times where there's a lot of change, there's a lot of turmoil, there's uncertainty. What do you mean by that, by being authentic and why is that important even in a, even in a downturn? Thanks for asking that question. And I know that you've had other CMOs on the program that have talked about this authenticity uh, concept in leadership. And I'm just, I'm so pleased to see us speaking more about it in leadership. And I know that authenticity can mean slightly different things to different people's leaders. And for me, it, it means that I can, I can show up as myself, uh, that I'm in an environment where people can be straightforward, uh, operate uh, from a basis of trust. Uh, and I see my role as a leader in, in helping create that trust uh, being able to be transparent, uh, being able to share uh, the good, the bad, and loudly in terms of what's working, what's not working, where we've got challenges, where we need to go, and and I take that you know across working at the leadership level as uh, and up at the executive level as well as uh, you know doing it appropriately uh, with the teams, and and some of that includes uh, being able to share facets of myself, not just the work side, but, but also about myself personally and, and invite people to to do the same and whatever degree that is, might be comfortable for them. And, uh, you know, through, we've had an economic downturn, we've gone through COVID, we've gone through all sorts of social challenges. And uh, for me, some of it was uh, really leaning into speaking openly as a leader about things that I was either concerned about or things that I cared about um, from either, you know, things that were going on in the outside world or challenges I personally felt uh, during the pandemic so that my team could see my own self and uh, and feel, you know, really empowered to um, share and speak up uh, so that we could all sort of take care of one another as we got through some, some challenging times. And, um, and that's something that I embraced uh, as we went through some you know, those difficult times. And, and I see it has become really a strength that I, uh, I'm, there's no going back. I'm, <laughs> that's something I'm going to take forward. Well, and is that, is that, is that it at, at, at the core of it, the importance of it? Is it that like, I don't know, when you, when you look at all great teams and, and, you know, and it's teams that can be business teams, but it could be like, you know, sports teams, championship teams and other things at some point, everyone has to come together and sort of put aside personal interests for like the good of the team. And you're going to be there and you're going to be there for someone and someone's going to be there for you. And you build out that trust, whatever kind of excellent performing team at some point has to get past individual self-interest. And is it that authenticity is a, is a mechanism to do that kind of quickly because the alternative is just like, what, what is the alternative? It, it sounds so simple to be authentic, but it's like, what's the alternative? Like, let's all try to be someone we're not and put on a front and try to act like how we think we're supposed to act. And let's do that instead. Like, is that, is that, is that it? But like, why is authenticity? Is it because of the team dynamic and fostering that sense of team that puts the team above individuals? Is that what it is or is it something else? Yeah, it's, it's really, really trying to understand where people are coming from, I think. And that helps uh, then get the best out of each individual and also um, for people to feel seen and understood if they need some grace, you know, and we, we have people with, you know, things going on in the background that we may or may not always be aware of. And and, uh, you know, as I look to uh, build high performing teams and then retain those great people, I want to make sure that, you know, we're creating working environments where they can deliver their best work and also feel supported to be there for a long time. We work in highly intensive industries and there's high demands on our performance and um, outputs and being able to also accommodate for the fact that we've got to you know support people's real lives in the background 
to me is really important and, and something that makes me excited to continue to be a leader. According to Brooke Cunningham, the secret to unlocking growth and revenue in uncertain times is OPM, other people's money. By joining forces with alliance partners and selling partners, you're able to pool resources and create powerful marketing campaigns without burning a hole in your own pocket. Staying ahead of the curve is all about adaptability and rapid response thought leadership. Keep your content fresh, relevant, and in tune with current trends, and you'll have your audience hooked, eager for more. You'll also reinforce your position on the cutting edge with every data study you create, report you write, or social media post you make. For Top CMO, I'm Ben Kaplan. This amazing episode was brought to you by Top Thought Leader. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe.